Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy and holy jumping has it been a while. My last video was the P47 back in January and basically my foot hasn't been off the gas since then. I had been working on another project that just became more and more challenging and was sucking up my mojo and basically got to the point where I went on a quick holiday down to Denver to go to a model show with members of the Plastic Posse and then came home and decided that I needed to build a model that was actually going to be fun to build and enjoyable. And the Sabre Mark VI fit the bill. This kit had been sitting in the stash for about two years after picking it up at a model show in Calgary and coming with the resin wingtips to convert this into a proper Mark VI. It also came with the Edward Photo Etch, which made a great reference to update it using the 3D printer to replace some of the parts. However, there are a few more things you do have to do to the kit, and being a fun slammer build, I sort of skipped over it. But we'll talk about the difference between a Canadair CL13 Saber and a North American Saber. With the rise of the Cold War shortly after World War II, it was decided that Canada would be part of NATO and provide fighter squadrons for protection in Europe and Germany. With the success of the North American F-86 Saber, it was decided that Canada would also buy that aircraft. This was during a time that the Canadian government had the ability to put resources into their defense industry and their own aircraft companies, so it was better to produce the aircraft in Canada and provide more jobs. The Canadian Mark I Sabre was pretty much identical to the North American F-86A, but like most aircraft companies, Canadair decided they could make the aircraft a little bit better and improve on it, and by the Mark VI, they had produced the best variant of the Sabre in regards to speed and maneuverability, based around the Arenda engine produced in Canada. They also clipped back the wings and added this leading edge slat to give the aircraft a low speed controllability that the American Sabre no longer had. During training in West Germany during the Cold War, American pilots were often frustrated when engaging the Canadian Sabres due to them basically being hot rods, and the Mark VI was regarded as the best dogfighter of its time. At the time, the Canadian aviation industry was a powerhouse with development of the Avro Aero and the Sabre being sold to the Royal Air Force, the German Luftwaffe, and to multiple other countries. It was a different world than it was today, with 12 Sabre squadrons operating in West Germany, whereas today, we have three Hornet squadrons. As great as the detail is in the Edward Photo Etch, I'm not a big fan of folding tiny, tiny parts and replacing 3D parts with 2D parts so it was much easier to go into Fusion 360 and design some replacements. All in all, it was about three hours of design and printing, and I had the parts in hand. One problem I did have with the Edward Photo Etch was the way they designed the seat and they want you to save kit parts to build it, and it was much easier just to design a seat in Fusion. This took a few more hours, but in the end it fit much better than the Photo Etch seat, which was way too narrow. Once everything in the cockpit was ready for paint, I primed it with some Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black and then used some Mr. Color Light Ghost Gray to paint the base. Because this is a lacquer paint, my usual trick is to paint all the details with acrylic. That way if I mess up or don't like how something looks, it's just a matter of using some water and a brush to remove it or correct it to tidy it up. You may be noticing the Vegas font that keeps popping up on the screen every so often. Yeah, there it is. Reason for that is I've had to build a new computer over the last few months in order to get back into video editing, gaming, all that fun stuff. And I'm using a demo version until I renew my subscription to Vegas. One quick tip for painting cockpit details is I like to use a quick dry brush using light gray just to highlight all those details and make them easier to see to the naked eye. And even with the Optivisor, that's a big help as well. For the red parts of the ejection seat, I'm using Mephiston Red. And I'm going, to, I'm going to come back in with a wash to dirty that up a little bit and to give it a more worn look. For the instrument panel dials, I'm using Mr. Color GX100 because it dries super clear, giving a great impression of glass. For the seat belts on the ejection seat, I use the Edward Photo Etch. If I wanted to add my own seat belts using Fusion 360, I would actually have to use another program called Blender to make those look really good and I don't have the time to be learning another program, so the Photo Etch to the rescue. To secure those Photo Etch pieces in place, I'm just using a simple, cheap super glue. 
the wash that I'm using here, I created using some Abtalung Starship Filth, thinned out with some AK Odorless Enamel Thinner. And instead of trying to clean that up completely, I just come in later with a flat brush with a little bit of thinner in it to try to blend it and give that filthy look. On top of the red pieces of the cockpit, I used a dark brown because I found the black was too harsh. And this was done in thin layers to slowly build it up. For doing the intake on this kit, there are a few ejector pin marks that you need to clean up. But if you want to cheat, Hasegawa also gives you the intake and exhaust plugs for the kit. I used some white Tamiya putty to fill in the holes and just let it sit overnight for a full 24 hours to harden. And I did this in a few thin layers to slowly build it up. Because I find if you put it on too thick, it tends to shrink a little bit more. Then I sand everything flush with the sanding sponge on a toothpick. And this may take a few passes. Final check is done with a nice thick Mr. Surfacer 1000 to make sure those pin holes aren't showing. And then it's time to move on to assembly of the trunk. After gluing the two halves together with some Tia cement, I use some gray putty just to fill in the seams as far as I can on the side. And then using the same procedure as the ejector pin marks, come in with some sanding sponge to try to blend them in. And again, this is going to take a few layers to properly do. You only have to do the first little bit of the seam because the trunk is so long, the shadows hide everything anyways. After that, it was time to use some Mr. Color Silver 8 to give the aluminum look of the trunk. And again, I only sprayed the first little bit of the trunk because you can't see the rest anyways with the shadow. Bringing the fuselage halves together doesn't bring any surprises, just don't forget to add your nose weight. I like using lead pellets because they're cheap and readily available across the street, and they're simple to glue into place. One thing I really enjoy about Hasegawa kits is that they're pretty simple to build and they're low in parts count, and they make for great slammer builds because generally they go together quite well. The only cleanup that I had to do on this kit was just the seam behind the cockpit where the two halves come together. And then after that it got a little spicy because I was doing some modifications by cutting the wingtips, but that was self-inflected and not re reflective of the kit. Another hack for this kit was to paint the camouflage on the nose before gluing it in place. I'm not a fan of trying to mask in intakes, so this was definitely a cheat that saved some time. Now for the surgery on the kit. Hasegawa gives you resin wingtip replacements, and I tried to cut this in a way that would make for less cleanup. Instead of making one straight cut, I followed the aileron and then the panel line in front of it. The resin tip has part of the aileron on it, but it was much easier just to cut that out and use the plastic from the kit. And of course, because the kit's older, the resin had shrunk a little bit, so I had to use some putty to build that back up. Using super glue to put the resin in place, I gave it a full day to harden, and then used some green stuff epoxy putty to build the resin back up where it had shrunk. After the putty had a full day to harden, I then used some sanding sticks to blend everything together, and then brought in my JLC razor saw to rescribe the line. You can see in this clip here why I chose to leave the aileron intact from the kit because it gave me a good guide for rescribing instead of trying to rescribe a tiny two millimeter piece. Then as a final check of the rescribing, I use a panel liner just to make sure everything's nice and tight and clean. As I was doing this modification, I watched another gentleman building a Colombian Canadair Mark VI who simply cut off the styrene wingtip and then cut out a section and re-glued it in. If you're using the leading edge Sabre decals, they actually have some updates in there as well that you need to make the Hasegawa F86 a Mark VI. Unfortunately, some of those modifications I didn't catch until I'd already done the bodywork and paint. This was a slammer build, and I didn't really want to get into the weeds on it. So to roll back the calendar a little bit, I'm going to explain why there hasn't been much content on this channel in the last few months. First, back in April, I went down to the Denver Model Show with members of the Plastic Posse, as I said earlier. And here's the thing, 
I saw so many cool aircraft and so many cool models that I came home motivated to build something cool. And the problem was I didn't know what I wanted to build. I went through my stash, everything was humming and hawing with, oh, I don't have aftermarket parts. I don't know if I want to do that. And I just kind of got into a slump where I did not know what to build. And I basically grabbed this kit off the shelf just to start building something. Was I super motivated to build a Sabre? No. I had just finished slamming together Edward's roof and finished painting Edward's MiG-21 to take with me to the model show. And the MiG-21 wasn't exactly my best work and I knew it going into the show. So I basically had this weird conundrum where I really wanted to build something cool and exciting, but I couldn't pick something and I also didn't really want to sit at the bench. So how do you solve that problem? If you know, leave a comment in the comment section below. What also wasn't helping me was at the same time I was building a massive kit from someone that sent it to demo for their company, and it was pretty much a block of wood. I was having to put so much effort and work into it to make it look good and representative of something I think they deserved. It just wasn't working out. Like For every step forward, I had two steps back, and the kit was just kicking my ass. So I eventually just had to put that away and move on to something. Just something to get my hands moving and keep my brain occupied. As much as I wanted to finish that kit and just have it done, you should never justify shit with time. Telling somebody that it took you four months to build a kit doesn't make up for it looking like trash. That may come across as me being arrogant, and I apologize if that's the case, but at the same time, I don't want something out there I'm not proud of. I also thought that I would put this video out here just to see if anybody else has ever been in that same boat where you're spending two hours looking at your stash, not knowing what you want to build or trying to figure out what resin you have or what you don't have and just kind of getting into that mindset of being in a slump. How do you get out of that? It didn't help that on top of all that, it was a busy time of the year for hockey and the reserves and then putting together a trip to Scotland. And if all of that wasn't enough, work was getting very busy and challenging, and I decided to apply for a new position that was opening up. So in the back of my mind, I was mentally preparing for how I was going to interview for that and sell myself. So the last day before going on vacation, I interviewed for that job, and basically got on a plane at the end of the weekend and left everything behind to enjoy two weeks with the family away from the bench and seeing some cool stuff in Scotland and in England. And I came back again, super motivated to build something at the bench. But this time, I wasn't going to let myself deal with a crappy kit. If you've been following me on Instagram, you should know what that kit is. And it's pretty representative of the British people. And it's big. Really big. For the paint on this aircraft, I used a mix of Mr. Hobby and AK Real Colors. Because the Royal Canadian Air Force used the British green, but then they also used the slate gray instead of the ocean gray the RAF used. And then on the bottom, they used into PRU blue. Kind of an odd mix, but it looked pretty cool all mixed together. And then I later found out that this was the same livery that they sold their aircraft to the Luftwaffe and the RAF. To add some simple depth to that paint, and to represent the brightness of the Air Force at the time, I used some lighter greens, yellows, browns, just to break it up and make it more interesting. I didn't want this aircraft to look flogged, because this was pretty much the high watermark of the Royal Canadian Air Force. The leading edge decals I was using for the kit, they're also made in Canada and only up the street from me. Well, not really up the street, they're made in Calgary, and I live about an hour and a half east of Calgary. Leading Edge's decals are very nicely done, and they let you do several aircraft at one set. The only negative thing I have to say about this kit is they give you a lot of carrier film on some of the decals, and it can be hard to blend that in. And that brings up the conundrum of the guys who say you need to gloss before decals to avoid silvering. On this build, like many of my other builds, I put the decals right on top of the paint. If my paint is smooth, the decals shouldn't really silver, and then it comes down to what liquids I'm using as a setter and softer to get those decals to suck down. For these decals, I use Mr. Mark Softer before applying the decal, and then I use Tamiya's Extra Strong Mark Fit to set them down. Here you can see the result. Everything went down smooth, 
there's no silvering and the only thing that's going to be an issue is that carrier film being so wide. So to blend in the carrier film, I'm going to apply a few coats of gloss and then I'm going to sand that gloss down to get rid of the carrier film. And once that's done, I'm going to use some flat coat to blend it all together. For sanding, I'm using a 3000 grit sanding sponge and some water to make sure I'm not building up any heat on that gloss and potentially wrecking the decals. Once that's all done and I'm happy with how the decals look, I'm going to use some water and a toothbrush to remove the dust from the sanding and then seal it all with a flat coat. And I'm using a stiffer brush just to make sure I'm getting into all those panel lines. With all that work done, now it's time for some Tamiya Flat Clear to blend everything together and then move on to weathering. As I stated earlier, I was going to keep weathering to pretty much a minimum on this jet just to represent the newly entering service and the fact that I wasn't fully invested in doing a crazy over the top weathering job. So this was just a case of a quick pin wash, wipe it off, and then according to IPMS standards should be a gold medal winner. But that's a topic for a different video. For the wash, I again used Abtaling Starship Filth with some enamel thinner. And you can see in the previous clip that I slowly mix it until it runs just a little bit. And that'll usually keep it in the panel lines, but still keep it easy to clean up. That's going to be it for this weird video that was all over the place. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked the build. And I hope it gave you some insight into my thought process and things that I deal with while I'm at the bench. It's not all sunshine and rainbows here. And sometimes just having my hands moving and building something is enough to keep my mind occupied. I am the model guy and I'll see you later. And while you're at it, make sure you click subscribe, leave a comment and a like, and follow me on Instagram. Or you can just skip to the next video. Choice is yours, but there's some cool stuff going on on Instagram. I'll see you next time.